Thank you again, Savina, um, for the warm introduction. Very kind. Um, thanks to all the organizers, Savina, Frank, Sebastian, and and the rest of you who've made this possible. And um, and thanks everybody for your for your patience, um, putting up with me over Zoom at the end of a busy day. Um, it's uh, giving giving me flashbacks of uh, the period when we were all on Zoom all the time, um, and thankfully. We're doing a little bit less of that these days. So um, with no further ado, I want to launch into the talk. Um, and as Sabina mentioned, um, the title is From Border War to Civil War, Populism, Fascism, and Authoritarianism. There's been an unmistakable global resurgence of openly and unabashedly authoritarian politics. Importantly, this is not merely a matter of right-wing political rhetoric, or even exclusively a matter of right-wing extra-state political violence, but also state practices of rule that have involved flagrant campaigns of state violence and political repression, as well as calculated policy interventions designed to erode or subvert many of the most elementary features of democratic proceduralism and the rule of law. The examples are numerous and multifarious, from the more classic variety of dictatorial power exercised by Vladimir Putin in Russia, including the suppression of the free press, the outlawing of dissent, and the imprisonment and assassination of political rivals, to Rodrigo Duterte's campaign in the Philippines to indiscriminately murder drug users and other petty criminals through extrajudicial killings, to Benjamin Netanyahu's initiative to subvert the powers of the Israeli Supreme Court, to Viktor Orban's explicit promotion of the notion of illiberal democracy to rationalize rule by decree in Hungary, to Donald Trump's and Jair Bolsonaro's incitements of attempted coups to overturn elections in the United States and Brazil, respectively, and so on and on. These forms of authoritarian politics and rule enact a kind of civil war, whereby the repressive resources of the state, ostensibly aligned with one segment of the quasi-democratic polity, come to be directed against another such segment of the population. I do not propose here to exhaustively analyze or theorize the numerous and heterogeneous manifestations of authoritarianism, but rather to highlight how one increasingly prominent expression of this authoritarian political tendency substantially derives much of its animating force from the specifically anti-immigrant racist obsessions of reactionary populism and incipient fascism. In short, the authoritarian project of civil war, a war or reign of terror primarily waged against fellow citizens, is increasingly predicated upon and made possible through the promulgation of legitimating discourses and practices of border war, a war or reign of terror primarily waged against non-citizens. Migration and borders, or more precisely, the spectacles of border crisis have taken center stage in public debate and policy interventions in migrant receiving countries worldwide. Across the globe, alongside an escalation in border violence, there's likewise proliferated a variety of reactionary right-wing populist political and social movements, many of which can only be adequately characterized, very frankly, as anti-immigrant fascism. In this context of alarmist yet incessant discourses of migrant crisis, refugee crisis, border crisis, nonetheless, extra state formations of anti-immigrant violence tend to merely amplify and supplement the more fundamental violence of the border enforcement regimes of state powers. That is to say, the populist enthusiasm for an increasingly authoritarian politics of borders and migration tends to simply intensify and extend the inherently authoritarian and despotic character of how borders serve as premier sites for the enactment of a state's sovereign power 
particularly as targeted against non-citizen border crossers. Reciprocally, and this is my principal claim here, it is this rather routine border authoritarianism that then animates and fuels a wider drift toward right-wing political authoritarianism. Thus, the fascistic political discourses of civil war that increasingly depict domestic or internal rivals as political enemies and social threats derive much of their elemental momentum from the nationalist metaphysics and nativist ethos of border war. Such fantasies of border war are themselves merely the hyperbolic expression of a more fundamental authoritarianism that is always already the standard operating procedure and normative premise of sovereign state power as it is routinely enacted through border enforcement. There is, in other words, a despotic and authoritarian character to all border policing and other forms of immigration enforcement, which is essential to modern would-be democratic state sovereignty and which comes to contaminate and invigorate more sweeping modes of political authoritarianism, whereby states ultimately deploy analogous forms of despotic power and violence, whether through cynical uses or abuses of the law against their citizens, in short, converting border war into civil war. As Giorgio Agamben notes, and I quote, civil war assimilates and makes undecidable brother and enemy inside and outside. The killing of what is most intimate is indistinguishable from the killing of what is most foreign. End quote. And here, if we recognize that civil war is the conceptual opposite of what we might call civil peace, then it is instructive to recall Michel Foucault's hypothesis in society must be defended that, and here I quote again, politics is the continuum of war by other means. As Foucault explains, and I quote, the role of political power is perpetually to use a sort of silent war to reinscribe that relationship of force and to reinscribe it in institutions, economic inequalities, language, and even the bodies of individuals. Consequently, even when we are writing the history of peace, and its institutions, he contends, we are in fact always writing the history of the that same war. Uh, thus it seems plain that authoritarian politics is a kind of reassertion and escalation of that same war, a partial retreat from the effective silence of that underlying relationship of struggle and submission into a more noisy, boisterous, and unabashedly belligerent disposition of power and repressive violence targeting one part of the putative polity, or indeed several subsections of that supposed polity, to reinscribe and reinstate the larger configuration of domination over a state's ostensible citizenry. To offer just one illustrative example from the case of increasingly forthright authoritarianism that I happen to know best, that of the United States, where I was born and have spent most of my life, where I currently live and where I am most directly implicated politically as a citizen and indeed more meaningfully and more accurately as a denizen, I call your attention to the current electoral campaign of Donald Trump. And as I should add, although my examples will focus on the United States, I think that they will resonate with examples from other contexts, and that is what I hope will be generative for our discussion. Um, as Trump is currently being indicted on 91 felony charges for crimes he committed while in office or thereafter across four criminal prosecutions in different judicial jurisdictions, alongside other civil lawsuits, Trump has made typical and compulsive gestures promising to weaponize the legal system to counteract his own legal vulnerability in these ongoing criminal and civil cases. While, of course, he cynically depicts, which, of course, he cynically depicts as persecution by his political rivals. 
in a campaign speech delivered on November 11th, Trump, that is to say just a few months ago, uh, Trump openly declared his intention, if reelected, to deploy the legal apparatus of the US Department of Justice and its police powers to punish his political opponents and critics and to purge the government of officials and civil servants whom he suspects of being insufficiently loyal to his authority. Just a few days prior, Trump's legal advisors had been exposed for drafting action plans to prosecute Joe Biden and other government officials and public figures who have been prominent critics, including several of Trump's own former highest level political appointees who have subsequently denounced him. He's even declared that his most outspoken critics in the military should be executed for treason. Moreover, Trump has also announced his plan to prospectively invoke the antiquated Insurrection Act, which was first enacted in 1792 and last updated in 1874. To invoke this antiquated Insurrection Act on his first day in office, to authorize himself to deploy the military against citizens engaging in protest demonstrations, thereby circumventing the legal prohibition against using the military for domestic law enforcement. The Insurrection Act is among the most potent of the US president's emergency powers, in part because it is also among the most susceptible to abuse, with the criteria for such a deployment of military force, or in the letter of the law, or any other means, military force or any other means against civilians, stipulated in vague and archaic terms, based on outdated assumptions with virtually no constraints or oversight, neither from the legislature nor the courts, and once deployed with no specified limits on what actions may be taken. Not only does the act authorize the president to deploy the US armed forces to suppress civil unrest or quell domestic violence, it also allows for the deployment of the militia, quote unquote, defined very broadly and vaguely to include a wide swath of able-bodied armed men. Simply put, the act effectively permits the president to deputize any sort of fascist armed gang that he deems to be loyal to him to participate in enforcing the state's presumptive monopoly on violence. Indeed, when in office, Trump had already flirted with the idea of invoking this law, most notably in 2020, to suppress the mass insurgency of Black Lives Matter protests against racist policing following the murder of George Floyd. And then again, following his loss in the 2020 election, when some of his most extreme advisors proposed a declaration of martial law to supervise the recount of voting ballots, but he had been reined in by some of his more cautious advisors. Now, however, especially given his determination to subvert his his own prosecutions and evade his own legal exposure, Trump flagrantly promises to be more daring. Thus, in advance of any actual events that could be likened, however implausibly, to anything vaguely resembling an insurrection, Trump nonetheless is making the authoritarian pledge to avail himself immediately upon re-election of an emergency power to institute a state of exception and to mobilize military force against the civilian population to bolster his power. After these revelations, Trump began publicly promoting these same authoritarian schemes as campaign promises. He unabashedly proclaimed, and here I quote, we pledge to you that we will root out the communists, Marxists, fascists, and the radical left thugs that live like vermin within the confines of our country that lie and steal and cheat on elections and quote, reinvoking his false and thoroughly discredited claim that the 2020 election was stolen from. And here I quote again, they'll do anything, whether legally or illegally, to destroy America and destroy the American dream. And quote, notably alongside his well-worn tactic of denouncing his opponents in the Democratic Party as the radical left, Trump also included the term fascists in a rhetorical bid to vacate the word of any substantive meaning, effectively aiming to deflect the increasing use of that term to criticize him by redeploying it against his own adversaries. 
In a telltale gesture articulating the ethos of civil war, Trump continued, and I quote, the threat from outside forces is far less sinister, dangerous, and grave than the threat from within. Our threat is from within, end quote. Indeed, Trump's discourse is very characteristically and predictably a veritable caricature of the conventional script whereby society must be defended. Nonetheless, the dehumanizing likening of his political rivals to sinister vermin who must be rooted out and by implication exterminated signaled a flamboyantly fascistic rhetorical move extravagantly conjuring the lurid menace of internal enemies who seek nothing less than to destroy America. When called upon to respond to criticism for these rhetorical excesses, Trump campaign spokesman Stephen Chung merely doubled down with similarly violent language, replying that such critics were deranged and that, quote, their entire existence will be crushed when President Trump returns to the White House, end quote. In the ensuing weeks, Trump repeatedly and brashly boasted that he will in fact seize the powers of a dictator on day one of his second presidency, albeit purportedly only for that first day back in power. The recourse to such an overtly dictatorial posture and such dehumanizing language with its implicit threat of the extermination of political enemies and its explicit threat of a mass campaign of punitive reprisals mark an escalation in Trump's vindictive, if desperate, authoritarianism. Importantly, if not surprisingly, these remarks about the existential menace of internal enemies, so-called vermin, who would purportedly destroy the nation, were delivered alongside a concomitant escalation in Trump's anti-immigrant rhetoric with an analogous recourse to a dehumanizing animalistic metaphor, Trump has frequently likened the putative foreign threat of migrants and refugees to a vicious, untrustworthy snake. In his more recent fascistic flourishes of scarcely veiled white supremacism, moreover, Trump declared that, quote, these people are poisoning the blood of our country. Migrants, that is. It's the blood of our country, he added for further emphasis. What they're doing is destroying our country. Admittedly, all of the pernicious compulsions of Trump's demagoguery may finally be little more than the opportunistic reflexes of a narcissistic psychopath with no moral scruples whatsoever and no genuine political ideological moorings, apart from his own obscene quest for self-adulation and consequently his perverse authoritarian will to power. In the predictable feedback loop of his narcissistic delusions of grandeur and his psychopathic need for self-aggrandizement, Trump has shown himself to be constitutionally incapable of disavowing anyone who supports him, which has meant that he reserves his most passionate affinity for those of his supporters who are the most extreme in their devotion culminating in an ever-ascending spiral of ugly synergies between him and his most fascistic followers. Trump's instinctual racism tends to be opportunistic, however, and his fundamentally racist demagogical reflexes serve most consistently for him to demonize his political opponents. Much of Trump's standard political rhetoric capitalizes on and exacerbates white fear, and his Democratic Party political opponents are made to serve as the convenient proxy for a terrifying spectral world of so-called illegal immigrants and criminals and terrorists. Thus, by conjuring impending mayhem and the cataclysmic prospect of a kind of racial Armageddon, Trump converts his nightmarish world of ghoulish enemies into political currency. Even if a devious opportunist and self-aggrandizing narcissist such as Trump cannot speak well or intelligently and does not defend any coherent or consistent ideology apart from the compulsive reflexes of his remarkably consistent white supremacism and racial nativism, to the extent that he can speak at all, he relies upon a rudimentary grammar that unites him in discourse with the larger political milieu in which he operates. That elementary grammar 
which unifies the entire discursive field of bourgeois democracy as such, as I've argued elsewhere, is populism. Pandering to, quotes, the people, in other words, is really the deep grammar of all modern democratic political life, and thus something more elemental than any proper political program or ideology. In the strictest, but also the most capacious sense of the word, populism is the promotion of the interests and prerogatives of the people. Who then, or indeed what, is the people, after all? Democracy in its simplest expression is understood to be government of, by, and for the people. The people is thus enshrined with a certain unquestionable halo of integrity as an essential premise of all democratic politics, inasmuch as it supplies the veritable source of modern state sovereignty. The people, therefore, supplies the indispensable but immediately vanishing ground of a political order that may hereby rest assured of the popular origin and democratic legitimacy of its sovereignty. Thereafter, the people is promptly and effectively decomposed and reduced once more to an aggregate of mere individuals with all their competing and contradictory private interests now recoded as citizens. Rather than the presumptive ideal of inclusion and belonging, citizenship has in fact long been a technology for the subordination of women and various categories of minority deployed as a means for the unequal, contradictory, and differential inclusion-exclusion within the legal regime of one or another state formation. However, unequally, in fact, citizenship nevertheless inscribes people as proper members belonging to an imaginary, abstract, and artificial political community of equals, which first appears in the form of the people, but customarily comes to be recoded as the nation. This indeed is how citizenship serves to stitch together such exalted notions as freedom, equality, self-government, democracy, and purportedly inalienable human rights with state power and nationalism. Simultaneously, in as much as citizenship decomposes various formations of communal life and sociality into an aggregate of individuals, uniform and commensurable legal persons, it nonetheless reconstitutes all citizens into an imagined national community that is presumed to encompass and subsume all other forms of social division and antagonism within a greater political unity, the nation. Notably, the refashioning of the people as the nation intrinsically involves a process of bordering. No modern state power is figured as an expression of the sovereignty of all people, the entire human race, but rather only as the territorially delimited and bounded manifestation of a particular people, a so-called nation, to which it is presumed to correspond as if by some natural birthright filiation. Despite its broadly inclusive and egalitarian mystique, therefore, once we locate citizenship as a kind of legal personhood within a polity defined by the territorial borders and juridical boundaries of a so-called national state, it becomes more clear that citizenship is always an inherently exclusionary and divisive framework for the production of various degrees of non-citizenship and thus legal non-personhood. Nativism, as I've long argued, is a unifying and animating force within nationalism itself. Nativism is the specific modality by which every nationalism is supplied with its defining and definitive politics of identity. And the identity politics of nativism can never be fully removed. More precisely, nativism equips the nation state with a national identity in the image of which to produce its people. The spectral people that authorizes populism and legitimates modern sovereign power thus must be retroactively manufactured through the persistent nationalist projects by which states aim to subject their captive populations. Hence, populism in all its guises is likewise always ensnared with one or another nationalism and invariably recapitulates some version of the nativism that secures the nation with an essential identity. Populism is therefore always implicated in a, in a project of reinstating or reinforcing the frontiers of the nation, 
those populist politics have thrived in scenarios where the people, our people, so-called, must be protected, whereby the insulation and refortification of the borders of the nation command a veritable rebordering of the people. Resurgent populism, whatever its ostensible egalitarianism and fatuous gestures toward the reassertion of democratic popular sovereignty, is inextricable from the national scale on which modern bourgeois democratic state power has been universally predicated, and thus can never escape the positing of a people that is always inherently bordered and stands only to be rebordered. If populism has widely come to be rendered synonymous with anti-immigrant nativism, therefore, it is plainly a symptom of the deeper nationalist metaphysics of a bordered world in which politics, law, justice, and democracy have been systematically posited primarily and inordinately on the national scale, and for which the presumable rights, entitlements, priorities, and prerogatives of the people tend to be indistinguishable from the claims and pretenses of nationhood. It's precisely through a distinctly reactionary populism that anti-immigrant nativism juxtaposes the people, routinely equated with various exclusionary notions of the putatively authentic nation, with the so-called alien menace of migrant or refugee invasion, a mob of so-called foreign intruders, infiltrators even, poised to usurp the ostensible sovereignty and presumptive patrimony of the people. In this respect, the external frontier of nationhood is always always operates simultaneously as an internal mechanism for bordering citizenship and alienage within the space of the state. Furthermore, and importantly, each nationalism is invariably challenged to confront its own inherent requirements for the stabilization of a national identity that can mediate not only the more conventional foreignness of migrants or refugees, but also remediate the foreign within and thereby tends to inexorably reveal that there are particular internal minorities presumed to be essentially inimical to the nation. Indeed, given the affinity of nationhood with nativity and thus the natal entitlements of sheer birth, such figures of foreignness, both internal and external, tend furthermore to systematically con be constituted in racialized terms. The nation, very much like race, is commonly posited to be a natal community that is predicated on shared ancestry and common kinship. Thus, every anti-immigrant nativism that is ostensibly oriented outward in the fortification of an external frontier tends to always also ramify inward in a racial project of national purification. Indeed, across the world, there have been an escalation of nativist populist convulsions against so-called illegal immigrants that have taken as their premier targets not migrants at all, but rather native-born, racialized minority fellow citizens. In the eastern borderlands of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, native-born Congolese citizens who are the descendants of Hutu and Tutsi people resident for generations on the Congolese side of the border have been derisively labeled Rwandans and targeted for expulsion. Similarly, in the Dominican Republic, the native-born descendants of migrant workers from neighboring Haiti, including many who were recruited for their labor generations earlier, have been racially recast now as Haitians, legally stripped of their birthright citizenship and rendered stateless denigrated as so-called illegal immigrants in the only land where they have ever lived. In India, likewise, measures to implement a citizen's registry have been deployed to deny the citizenship of hundreds of thousands, possibly millions, of native-born Muslims, again recasting them as some kind of illegal immigrants, so-called. Meanwhile, in Myanmar, Rohingya Muslim native-born citizens have similarly been legally stripped of their citizenship, castigated as so-called illegal immigrants from Bangladesh and confined in virtual concentration camps and subjected to vicious genocidal pogroms 
Indeed, these examples are but a few of the more extraordinary among a proliferation on a global scale of new formations of nativism directed not merely at migrant foreigners, but rather toward minoritized fellow citizens who come to be repurposed as virtual illegal immigrants and de facto so-called foreigners, indeed often as outright enemies within the space of the nation state. In these examples, it is indeed the anti-immigrant nativist ethos of border war that comes to play an indispensable role in invigorating populist convulsions of civil war, authoritarian or fascistic campaigns of national and racial purification against putative threats or enemies that are strictly internal to the intrinsically heterogeneous, contradictory, and antagonistic space of the nation. What is remarkable for my purposes here is that such violence against fellow citizens is now so increasingly authorized and legitimated only by rebranding them as putative migrants. Populism has indeed made migration a veritable obsession. This is because despite the sheer brutality and structural violence of border policing on a global scale, human beings continue to prevail in their mobility projects, unceasingly and tirelessly establishing migration as a central and constitutive fact of our global post-colonial presence. Consequently, migration is not merely a symptom of the protracted and convulsive crises of a world order racked by poverty, dispossession, warfare, and genocidal violence, but also a viral fermenting agent that instigates crises of sovereignty for state powers. Confronting the autonomy of migration and refugee movement, various European countries, as well as the United States, have increasingly refashioned the figure of the refugee as an always potentially nefarious one against which the people or the nation must be protected and against which sovereign state power seeks to inoculate itself. Thus, we've witnessed the effective collapse of the dominant ideological dichotomy between the figure of the good and deserving refugee in contradistinction with the figure of the opportunistic so-called illegal migrant. The transgressive autonomy of migration now also manifest as an unsettling autonomy of asylum activated by refugee mobilities has served to provoke the sovereign power of states into very quickly recoding so-called deserving victims as devious infiltrators, rebranding people fleeing violent conflict and persecution, previously presumed to be owed compassion, pity, and protection, now as an inchoate menace, potential terrorists, rapists, and criminals waiting for the opportunity to ambush, attack, and exploit the nation. Despite the routinely alarmist and often hysterical language of border crisis, the anti-immigrant and racist fanaticism and fascist violence that nativist populism incites, like Nazi anti-Semitism in Hannah Arendt's memorable phrase, is truly and simply an outrage to common sense. And here I'm quoting Arendt, there is hardly an aspect of contemporary history more irritating and mystifying than the fact that of all the great unsolved political questions of our century, it should have been this seemingly small and unimportant Jewish problem that had the dubious honor of setting the whole infernal machine in motion. Such discrepancies between cause and effect outrage our common sense. The notion that migration today is so pervasively deployed as a catch-all explanation for the vast assortment of neoliberal capitalism's social woes similarly defies any reasonable sense of proportion between putative cause and effect. Yet the unrelenting production of border spectacles, which rely so thoroughly on the staging of the material and practical work of border policing as always insufficient and overwhelmed, constantly project the alarmist sense of a crisis that urgently requires only more of the same, more resources for more border policing and more physical barricades and more draconian measures to further augment the actually existing authoritarianism of the border and immigration regime. Exciting and aggravating the deep racial anxieties of besieged national prerogative 
that these spectacles of migrant invasion underwrite various formations of border fascism and anti-immigrant racist militancy rise to meet the demands of an apparent state of emergency. What is telling, however, is that these vigilante border warriors largely understand their mission as simply replicating and reinforcing the border policing agencies that are perceived to be inevitably overwhelmed by the thankless task of fending off the migrant invasion, so-called. The anti-immigrant fascists commonly aspire to simply assist in the routine work of enforcing the border and tend to fashion themselves merely as a kind of volunteer force of reinforcements to support the beleaguered border police. That is to say, these fascistic formations of paramilitary extra-state violence ordinarily understand themselves to be merely a supplement to the border regime. Their exceptional extra-state extremist violence is frequently nothing more than an amplification of the inherently despotic and authoritarian violence of the border itself. In, 1907, in 1977, for instance, the Ku Klux Klan organized an armed militia called the Klan Border Patrol Watch and mobilized to patrol the U.S.-Mexico border. Indeed, this may, have well, the, this may well have been the originary instance of the sort of extra-state paramilitary vigilantism, specifically targeting illegal migration, so-called, that has since become endemic along the U.S.-Mexico border. Such right-wing anti-immigrant racists organized in armed militias have mobilized to emulate the U.S. Border Patrol itself, and in the name of providing their self-styled support for border enforcement, have taken the matter of kidnapping migrants into their own hands making a sport of quote unquote hunting for illegals, rounding up, arresting and detaining migrants and refugees, including children at gunpoint. Such self-anointed soldiers mobilized in the defense of the US border against the phantasm of an invasion of illegal migrants plainly predate Trump's rise to political prominence. Nonetheless, anti-immigrant racist vigilantes armed with combat weapons patrolling the U.S.-Mexico border with general impunity, installed themselves as a seemingly permanent fixture of the border regime during Trump's years in office, when their discourse was effectively indistinguishable from that of the U.S. president and the highest authorities of the state. Indeed, the indisputable upsurge in public actions during the Trump presidency and since by overtly white supremacist and avowedly fascist armed militias, as well as so-called lone wolf mass shootings and assassination plots by devoted Trump supporters have merely translated into action what has always been inherent in the unrelenting escalation in Trump's rhetorical animosity toward his perceived foes. Trump's speech has effectively served as both an incitement and a retroactive vindication of the violence of his supporters throughout his political career on no other grounds than that they are his supporters and they are targeting those whom he has overtly identified or who may be implicitly deemed as his, as his adversaries. The attempted coup of January 6, 2021, of course, was the ultimate manifestation of this phenomenon. Importantly, however, some of these incidents of pro-Trump and Trump-incited political violence have been acts of expressly racist or anti-Semitic terror, commonly associated with the notion of an impending peril of border invasion. Whereas Trump's castigation of the specter of so-called illegal migration as an invasion evokes a constant sense of border war, it also authorizes racist hostility against all Latinos, and other racially branded non-white groups, regardless of any particular individual's immigration status or naturalized U.S. citizenship or birth in the United States and birthright U.S. citizenship, and regardless of that group's historical presence in the United States or the longevity of their historical claims to belonging within the space of the United States. Thus, the discourse of border war quickly becomes indistinguishable from something approximating race war. Moreover, 
the recurring agonistic theme that white racial terror must be perpetrated to quote unquote, defend our country against a putative invasion or a hostile takeover by people of color exudes a manifest logic as well as an exorbitant, emphatic, increasingly explicit discourse whereby race war becomes apprehensible as another name for civil war. Abiding by the most elemental logic of war, those designated as the enemy must be destroyed. This indeed is the ethos of civil war. As partisans for Trump and the corrosive ethos of civil war, the most militant of his supporters consequently prepare actively for the annihilation of their enemies. The ethos of civil war obliterates any of the conventional normative distinctions of politics, whereby differences and disagreements can coexist within a civic space of a shared public. In Agamben's terms, civil war as a political paradigm exposes the artifice of the social contract, revealing the intrinsically mythological character of the social covenant that is purported to have fabricated the civic fraternity of citizenship as the foundation of modern democratic sovereignty and properly public life. Thus adopting Agamben's phraseology, the public mutuality of citizenship is shorn of its mystique in a manner that depoliticizes politics as usual, such that fellow citizens with different political perspectives and different partisan affiliations are no longer mere political competitors in a shared public sphere, but rather converted into outright enemies with whom nothing can remain in common. Meanwhile, the bases of private affinity and allegiance, above all in the United States today, white racial identity and nativist populism are politicized anew and increasingly appear for many of Trump's supporters to be the exclusive ultimate foundation for politics. By exposing the artificial national family as a fabrication, this ethos of civil war compels the forlorn desire for the impossible intimacy and communion of nationhood as a virtual civic family to retreat into the ostensibly real kinship of blood. The civic nation of fellow citizens and its public are irreparably fragmented. The democratic people is irredeemably fractured and the so-called true nation is now rebordered as race. Thus the agonistic mission of recuperating and reinvigorating the nation as in Trump's signature slogan, make America great again, is translated now as a project of crushing internal enemies who would destroy America and foreign menaces who poison the blood of the country. Nativist populism thus becomes increasingly inseparable from a, a retreat into internecine racial tribalism, in short, white nationalism. And white nationalism invigorated by an ethos of civil war spells fascism. Whatever may be the variety of competing definitions of fascism arising inevit inevitably from heterogeneous historical examples, this indeed is one of the decisive hallmarks of fascism, the extra state paramilitary organization of armed violence as the self-styled popular vanguard of a counter-revolutionary nationalist project, appeals to the ruling elite to rely upon an extra state parliament paramilitary formation of armed violence to defend or advance their interests and enforce their will, above all in the form of organized attacks against their perceived enemies, has always been a defining centerpiece of fascism as a social movement. It transposes the ethos of civil war into a specific kind of action plan. The mobilization of pro-Trump extremists, especially in the form of fascist gangs and militias, simply but ruthlessly pursues the ethos of civil war to its logical conclusion, that the political destruction of the enemy should culminate in its physical annihilation. What is truly remarkable, moreover, is that while there has always been, while there have, have always been self-styled fascist formations and other violent extremists on the far right fringes of US political life, these newer fascist gangs that arose during the Trump presidency mobilized to perpetrate violence as an enactment of their fervent allegiance to the man who was actually occupying the office of the U.S. presidency, 
who has always consistently refused to repudiate them. Thus Trump's desperate and irresistible compulsion to seek the adulation of the most fervent of his supporters has cultivated a toxic synergy between a rising tide of fascism that is energized by what his political demagoguery enables and his own authoritarian impulses, which are fueled and emboldened by the only partly delusional sense that there is a veritable social movement composed of people authentically ready to kill and die for him. There is then undeniably a mutually energizing and reinforcing symbiosis between a rising tide of overt and explicit fascist movements aligned with Trump and their extra state political violence on the one hand and Trump's self-aggrandizing political opportunism and all of its intrinsic authoritarian proclivities on the other. Trump is enthralled by the allegiance and fervor of his most fascistic supporters, and he actively cultivates those forces as a kind of reserve for the sort of political violence that ensued on January 6, 2021, where their volatility and violence might have provided the added impetus for a scheme to overturn the election in Trump's favor and could have supplied the pretext for a variety of more formal quasi-legal measures to enact a coup that would have actually been executed by Trump's administration and his supporters in the Congress and the Senate. But ultimately, Trump has little faith in the capabilities of such ragtag, self-styled paramilitary fascist militias. He does not depend on them and is unwilling to rely on them, at least not yet. In these important respects, Trump's unreserved white supremacist tendencies and his instinctive fascist sympathies and the veritable fascism that is at least tactically aligned with his political power do not amount to Trump serving as the supreme leader and chief spokesman in any simple sense for a fascist movement. They do not amount to Trump serving as the supreme leader for a fascist movement. Importantly, his prospective retaking of the presidency does not depend on the accession to power of a reactionary mass social movement. It remains an electoral gambit for Trump, although, as we already saw in 2020, an electoral failure will surely not impede him from more desperate measures to disregard and subvert the election's results. Most importantly for our purposes, should he manage to retake the US presidency, he seeks to manipulate and mobilize authorities already perspective of, perspectively available to him through the ex executive exercise of state power. What remains to comprehend more thoroughly, therefore, is that, is that authoritarian disposition and its distinct political reflexes. As, as we've already seen, Trump now openly announces his plans to aggressively pursue his political aims with renewed authoritarian zeal and malice. His unapologetic and unabashed authoritarian ambition is on dazzling display. It is emphatic and explicit. Trump exudes a disdain for the rule of law, particularly, particularly when it has applied constraints upon his own actions or limits to his own power when in office. Yet he nevertheless fashions himself as the strongman styled champion of law and order, whereby the fetish of the law merely implies swift and brutal punishment for those against whom society must be defended, against whom the people must be protected. These authoritarian populist gestures are not new and not at all subtle. Trump's predilection for authoritarian power has been a continuous thread through his entire career in public life, predating his entry into politics by decades. Trump's authoritarian contempt for the rule of law and his avowed desire and repeated previous attempts while in office to weaponize the law and the prosecutorial powers of the federal government against his critics are, of course, well-documented and well-known. In office, Trump repeatedly demanded the political loyalty of the highest ranking officials in the law enforcement, military, and national security agencies of the U.S. state, and otherwise unrelentingly sought to curtail their independence from the mandates of his executive power. He simultaneously installed an enormous number of ultra-conservative federal judges in a classically authoritarian mission to domesticate the judiciary and ensure its civility to executive power. Nonetheless, it is precisely by means of the law and the tactical deployment of the legal authorities of the state and its already established powers 
of legal prosecution and enforcement that this authoritarian impulse devises to exact retribution and mete out punishment. During his first term as president, Trump's utter ignorance of elementary procedures and legal frameworks and his governmental incompetence meant that his highest level appointees, ultra conservative Republicans though they were, were nonetheless institutionalists who often had to present modest challenges and impose obstacles to his most extreme excesses. Many of them subsequently repudiated him as unfit to hold office. Moreover, lifelong professional civil servants frequently presented still more intransigent resistance to Trump's efforts to deploy the executive power of the presidency for improper ends, such as exacting personal vengeance on those with whom, on those whom he deemed his enemies or detractors. Consequently, with an eye on returning to the presidency, he now is mobilizing a team of more seasoned and more fanatical lieutenants who share his taste for autocratic power. His current advisors are literally compiling a list of 20,000 tested Trump loyalists who would be promptly installed into key governmental positions in a massive and unprecedented purge of the lifelong civil servants who previously impeded his efforts. Now, my claim here is that a veritably full spectrum authoritarianism is to a noteworthy degree being planned and prospectively authorized in a manner that in its practical implementation would derive much of its energy from the routine authoritarianism of the border. The rhetoric of border war is of course a signature of Trump's politics and it remains so. When he began to brazenly boast that he will become a dictator but only on day one, Trump tellingly coupled his pledge to violently repress the domestic protests of citizens with the putative necessity of assuming such exceptional powers in order to respond militarily to an ostensible border crisis provoked by the autonomous border crossings of non-citizens. Notably, despite the utter preposterousness of the notion that the recent upsurge in border crossing and asylum seeking could ever be reasonably likened to an actual military invasion, much less an insurrection, Trump has asserted that the antiquated Insurrection Act authorizes the exceptional measures that would allow him to deploy the military to apprehend migrants at the border and conduct immigration raids throughout the interior. In campaign speeches beginning in September 2023, Trump has repeatedly invoked the example of the militarized deportation dragnet of 1954, known as Operation Wetback, among numerous other cruelly punitive measures, Trump is announcing plans for a massive campaign of workplace raids and sweeps of public places to arrest literally millions of undocumented migrants already resident within the United States and their indefinite imprisonment in a new sprawling network of border detention camps that he intends to build along the US-Mexico border as they await their expedited deportations while stripped of all due process of law. Despite the devious claim that he would embrace dictatorial powers for only one day, Trump's pr prospective recourse to emergency military powers also includes a renewed pledge to build the infamous border wall that he never in fact succeeded to build during his first four year term as president and which could plainly never, never be accomplished in a single day. He also promises to reinstate his previous Muslim travel ban and the refusal of entry to asylum seekers on the spurious grounds of public health emergency measures. Furthermore, in a move that would subvert one of the established provisions of US citizenship as established following the abolition of slavery in the 14th amendment to the US constitution, Trump also aims to terminate the birthright citizenship for babies born in the United States to undocumented migrant parents. Thus, he promises a multifaceted onslaught of militarized repression against migrants and also their US citizen children, whereby the use of exceptional powers could become routine features of everyday life. Notably, the leading architect of Trump's immigration strategies and tactics, both during his time in office and currently, Stephen Miller, contends with derisive confidence that all of the draconian measures that Trump's advisors are preparing rely on existing statutes 
The plan that he and other advisors are devising is intended to be implemented without any new substantive legislation. Here I quote, Trump will unleash the vast arsenal of federal powers to implement the most spectacular migration crackdown, Miller declares. He portrays Trump's immigration and border plans as a blitz designed to overwhelm immigration rights lawyers, adding, and I quote, the immigration legal activists won't know what's happening. Miller vowed that a prospective second Trump administration would employ, and I quote, the right kinds of attorney, uh, the right kinds of attorneys, and the right kinds of policy thinkers. End quote. Willing to implement such aggressive and extreme measures. Bottom line, he said, Trump will do whatever it takes. In short, according to this strategy, Trump's perverse and sadistic fantasy of mass punishment and persecution for migrants simply requires the right kind of authoritarian interpretive disposition to fully exploit the fundamental authoritarianism already, already thoroughly entrenched in the existing legal enforcement apparatus of the border and immigration regime. So to conclude, the ethos of border war against migrants as putative external or foreign threats then is pivotal for advancing a far more ambitious project of full spectrum authoritarianism that seeks to enact something approximating a police state that would selectively wage a kind of targeted civil war against any and all who may be deemed to be internal enemies. The extravagant authoritarianism that now announces itself in advance with regard to Trump's desire to speedily crush political opposition and dissent is invigorated by the belligerent confidence that illiberal authorities and emergency powers are already available to anyone occupying the office of the US president who is willing to avail himself of them. It is the despotic power intrinsic to the policing authorities of the border regime that supplies the template for migrating, so to speak, such authoritarian proclivities inward into the center of civic life converting border war into civil war. Any outrage or atrocity that can be perpetrated against non-citizens can be repurposed for the treatment of citizens, rendering indistinguishable and undecidable the putative nation's ostensible inside and outside, and ultimately authorizing the targeted destruction of what is most intimate by means of the sorts of violence customarily reserved for that which is designated to be a foreign enemy. Thank you.